Hey everyone, welcome to lecture eight. Today we are going to be talking about free trade versus protectionism. So last time we introduced a framework for doing an economic analysis of the effects of tariffs or other protectionist policies. We saw that tariffs can raise the price of both traded and domestic goods. This will reduce imports. Um, or if we're looking at something like an export subsidy, this will increase exports. And this is going to be beneficial to producers, but the cost to consumers is going to be greater. Uh, today, we're going to uh, think about some arguments for or against various trade policies. Um, and we're, we're going to be thinking about uh, trying to answer the question of should countries be protectionist or is free trade just better overall? So, um, the argument for free trade has really popped out of everything that we've been doing so far, all the economic analysis. You know, in the trade theory part of the course, we saw that um, there are typically aggregate gains from trade. So countries are better off under free trade because of the advantages of specialization in trade. Um, last lecture, we saw a way of actually measuring the costs of deviation from free trade. Um, and that comes from the efficiency losses of uh, policy like tariffs. So over here, this is the effect of a tariff for a small country, um, and the efficiency losses are these two triangles here. So relative to the actual cost of this good, uh, which begin by the world price, we are overproducing and underconsuming. And uh, you know, policy around the world today largely reflects the efficiency case for free trade. Tariff rates are typically low, and things like import quotas, export subsidies are rare. Um, you know, every country has some form of tariff or other protectionist policy, but um, the impact of them is not as big as it was in the past. And so, uh, you know, recently people have tried to estimate the cost of, of existing protection protectionist policies, um, and, and these estimates from the textbook are a little bit outdated from 2004, but. Uh, not much has changed since, and it says that the cost of existing protection around the world is just about 1% of global GDP. So uh, there are some efficiency losses from protectionist policies, but it's just not that big of a deal anymore. Still, protectionist policies do exist. Um, they play a really outsized large role, outsized uh, role politically. And in fact, much of the decline in protectionism is due to institutions like the World Trade Organization or regional trade agreements that place limits on the protectionist policies that countries, countries can actually implement. So clearly there's this latent demand for protectionism. You know, it's something that governments, if left to their own devices, would like to do more of sometimes. Um, and the question is, what are the justifications for that? Why are governments so interested in protectionism? So one argument that uh, we saw last time, uh, again, just from our analysis of the effects of trade policies um, is the optimal tariff argument. So for large countries, tariffs can push down import prices, which leads to what we call a terms of trade gain. So terms of trade, think of that as the relative price of your export goods. And so if you lower the price of, you, of your imports, you're getting a good deal on what you're buying. And, and that's good. And in some cases, this can actually outweigh the efficiency losses of tariffs. So a net increase in welfare from tariffs is actually possible for a large country. There's some tariff um, that is going to lead to a net increase in welfare. And the optimal tariff argument is basically, well, if it's good for national welfare, then we should be doing it, right? I mean, why not? And so the question is, you know, which tariff generates the largest net gain? Um, there's a simple little proof you can do that the net tariff or the tariff that generates the largest net gain is positive. So think about it this way. Um, if you have a tariff of zero, there's no terms of tra trade gain and no efficiency losses because you haven't done anything. If you have a tariff that is um, prohibitive, which means that it it makes imports so expensive that nobody imports anything. Um, then you, again, don't have any imports, which means that there's no tariff revenue. So there's no terms of trade gain. Um, and the efficiency losses are gonna be high there. And so 
as you reduce this tariff from uh, you know the fully prohibitive rate, um, then you're increasing imports a little bit. So the terms of trade gain is growing and you're reducing efficiency losses. So the efficiency losses are shrinking and over here it's the opposite. And so there's some positive tariff in the middle where the net gain is gonna be positive. And so the optimal tariff argument is, well, you know, basically countries should be doing this calculation, figuring out, you know, for all of our imports, what's the optimal tariff? It has the largest increase in national welfare. Um, and, and that's just how we'll set our tariffs. Um, and so there's actually, you know, there's, there's some evidence that this is true. Um, so um, one thing about the terms of trade gain is that uh, the way it works is that when you raise the price of this good, import demand falls and the world price of the, import, the imported good falls as a result. And so it's that fall in price that's really generating the terms of trade gain. And so for goods where the prices are more sensitive to import demand, the optimal tariff is going to be higher. And so um, if you look across goods, you know, some are gonna be more sensitive to demand, some are gonna be less sensitive and you, where, where, um, where the price is more sensitive, we should see higher tariffs. And there's some evidence that this is true. Um, so research testing this hypothesis finds that countries set higher tariffs on goods with more responsive prices. Um, and, and this is actually, you know, the effect size here is, is pretty substantial. Um, it's about nine percentage points, which is equivalent to the average tariff rate for the US. And there is a stronger effect of um, the sensitivity to changes in demand of prices for tariff rates that are not constrained by WTO rules. So when countries actually have the ability to set tariffs, they seem to be doing this optimal tariff calculation and, um, and actually setting their tariffs based on it. Uh, so, so this is a paper, by the way, that's by uh, Christian Broda, Nunali Mao, and David Weinstein. And Nunali Mao is a, is a professor at UFD. So it does appear that some protections policies are motivated by the terms of trade gains that we saw in our analysis of the economic effects of tariffs. Nevertheless, it's not so clear that this is a good idea. It's not clear that it's, it's good for countries to be doing this or in their own interest. And the reason is that optimal tariffs are a negative sum game. It's basically a costly way of transferring resources from the exporting country to the importing country. And so let's, um, let's just do a short little analysis of a two good two country model and what happens when one country starts doing optimal tariffs and how the other country responds. So um, home is going to impose a tariff on their import sector. The price of their import falls. This generates a terms of trade gain in home and a terms of trade loss in a way. Remember, whenever there's a terms of trade gain, someone is bearing a terms of trade loss because it's about the relative price of um, exports to imports. And so um, if home has cheaper imports, that means away has cheaper exports and that's not good for them. So in response, say that away imposes tariffs on their import sector. Now the price of homes export falls, relative prices are back to where they started, right? Homes import, uh, sorry, export to import price ratio is back where it was. Um, and so their terms of trade gate goes away and away goes back to where it started. The terms of trade loss goes away. So now there's no net gain for either country. And in fact, there's a net loss because in the process of imposing these tariffs, each country um, has introduced these efficiency losses. But they're gonna be worse off than before. So this was a simple little model of a trade war. Um, how that can be, you know, maybe beneficial in the short run in this optimal tariff sense, but it doesn't work for everyone. And when the other country starts responding, the gains go away and you're stuck with the losses. And so trade wars like this do happen, um, you know, are, have, have happened in the US uh, in very recent history. Uh, but the state of motivation of trade wars is, is really rarely in terms of, of terms of trade gains or, um, you know, optimal tariffs or anything like that. 
So if we if we take that rhetoric seriously, you know, you know why people say they do protectionist policies, then there's got to be some other motivations for, for protectionism um, that are guiding them. <clears throat> so another common one is the domestic market failure argument. So remember that one effect of tariffs is increasing domestic production. In the benchmark model, you know, our simple economic analysis of tariffs, this was a source of efficiency losses. We're overproducing relative to the real marginal cost. But suppose that there's some market failure that leads the non-tariff level production to be inefficiently low. So as an example of this, suppose that there's some positive externality of domestic production. The positive externality means that, you know, you know there's some benefit to society or the home country of producing some good, um, but the producers themselves don't capture it. And so the producers themselves, they're gonna, you know, maximize their own internal profit or, you know, internal welfare standard, and it's not gonna include this benefit to society. So from the perspective of society, production is gonna be inefficiently low. And while a tariff is a way of increasing domestic production, you know, incentivizing producers to produce more, so it could be the case that tariffs can alleviate this domestic market failure. And so a couple examples of this, uh, we've, we've talked about some in this course so far. One would simply be external economies of scale. So if one firm produces more, this is gonna be beneficial for all other firms. But that's, that's an externality, right? This firm isn't going to take into account the beneficial effect it's going to have on uh, the industry as a whole and national income. And this is, uh, you know, it's quite similar to the infant industry argument. So, um, you know, with internal economies of scale, it could be possible for companies to overcome competition with developed industries themselves because they capture the own effects of their scale with external economies of scale, that's, that's unlikely because of the externalities. And you can also think of labor market frictions that lead to unemployment as another type of externality. Um, so if we have more domestic production here, that could be a way of encouraging full employment if there's you know, some friction that's gonna help us or prevent us from reaching it otherwise. <clears throat> But on the other hand, though, we, sh we should ask this question of whether tariffs are the most efficient way to raise domestic production. Uh, so remember, the other effect of tariffs was that they raised prices for consumers. And this was another source of efficiency losses. And so we're balancing uh, these two things here. You know, on the one hand, we want to incentivize domestic production. But on the other hand, we don't want to disincentivize domestic consumption because that's a source of efficiency losses, unless we've got some other externality on the consumption side. Um, and so um, it's really sort of raises the question of, you know, if there's some market failure involving production, why is a tariff the policy to answer that, right? A tariff is gonna always hit production and consumption simultaneously. You can't disentangle them, you know, um, why not implement some other policy that directly incentivizes domestic production without hurting consumers? So an example of this would simply be a production subsidy. Um, so just for every unit of output, the government decides to pay suppliers X amount. And it could even be the same as the tariff. So this would have the same effect on producer prices that would incentivize um, suppliers to produce more. But consumers aren't going to bear the burden of that subsidy. And so this is a way of, you know, internalizing externalities or addressing market failures without dealing with the efficiency losses from the consumption side. So this is an example of something that's called the targeting principle. Um, and it's kind of a general idea. It's not something that's always going to be exactly true. But the idea is that when there's a market failure, the optimal policy is going to tend to target the failure directly. So in the case of a positive externality from domestic production, that's a market failure that's in domestic production. Um, and so the optimal policy there is gonna target domestic production directly. So the targeting principle um, would say that a justification for trade policies would be if we have market failures that are 
have something to do with trade itself. You know, there's something about importing goods or exporting goods um, that is the motivation for the policy and not something that's going on in the domestic economy. Um, and it's actually, it's, it's difficult to think of what a market failure associated with trade would be. Um, one example would be if there's something about exporting in particular that leads to positive externalities. Um, this is not, you know, this is not crazy or unjustified. Um, not all firms export. Uh, it's actually quite rare for firms to export. And there's some evidence that firms that do export um, tend to be much more productive than other firms. And they tend to grow faster than other firms. You know, exporting is this barrier that once firms cross is associated with positive, you know, future performance. And so it could be that maybe there's something about exporting and interacting with global markets that um, it, it's, it, it's hard for firms to uh, internalize the benefits of because there could be things like knowledge spillovers um, or it's just a, a barrier because of financing or something that firms would be able to internalize but they have a hard time overcoming. Okay, so another argument for tariffs is, um, you know, that maybe the economic analysis we've been doing is a little bit unfair to them. Because uh, remember, after all, tariffs are taxes. And, you know, governments need to get revenue, and pretty much any tax that governments are going to do is going to have some efficiency costs. So it seems a little bit unfair to just point to the efficiency costs of tariffs and say, ah, this is a bad idea. I mean, we could do the same for consumption taxes or income taxes or property taxes or anything. Well, anything but a, a pure lump sum tax. That's the only tax that doesn't have efficiency costs, but we don't do those for reasons that are pretty obvious. It would involve everyone paying a fixed amount to the government regardless of ability to pay. So, you know, tariffs in particular are a tax on imported goods. So what if we compared them to not the no tax scenario, but a tax on all goods, you know, a tax that treats domestically produced goods and foreign produced goods symmetrically? So this is a little bit difficult to show, but in general, taxes that treats good symmetrically are going to be more efficient. And by efficiency, we mean that there's going to be um, fewer efficiency loss per revenue. So per unit of revenue that a government is going to raise, um, an overall consumption tax, you know, something that hits all goods equally, is going to have less utility costs than an import tariff. Why? Well, the reason is that tariffs distort the relative price of imports. And, and by that, I mean the price of imports relative to domestically produced goods. So a consumption tax and a tariff both, ha both have the effect of consumers consuming less overall. But with a tariff, because it changes the relative price, it also means that consumers are consuming a lower ratio of imports to domestics than they would like to at the real opportunity cost of imports. So basically changing revenue, or sorry, changing relative prices introduces an additional source of efficiency costs that a broad-based consumption tax isn't going to have. And in particular, this isn't really something that we can analyze in our partial equilibrium model, because you know, remember when we're talking about relative prices, we need to be thinking about multiple goods, multiple equilibriums in different sectors, and so we need general equilibrium. So this is difficult to show, but just as a general principle, you know, treating commodities symmetrically is going to be more efficient in terms of taxation. However, um, you know, this sort of assumes that a, a broad-based consumption tax or other broad-based taxes are actually something that a government can feasibly implement. And it could be the case that, uh, you, you know, those policies are just not in the government's choice set, but a tariff is. So um, as an example of this, in the United States, up until about 1860, tariffs accounted for pretty much all of the United States, the United States government's revenue. Um, so I think it was the Tariff Act of 1790 or something. Um, and it was, uh, this was one of Alexander Hamilton's big initiatives as the first treasury secretary. He realized that the US government needed more revenue and the solution was higher tariffs. Um, and this was a big deal because this was, this was like, you know, how the United States government like First had its big plan for getting amounts, you know, large amounts of money that it was going to spend. 
Um, and, and so in this early US period, tariffs were really um, almost all of the United States government's federal revenue. And this is something that in developing countries around the world today, we see that it's you know maybe not so severe, but they do rely on tariffs for revenue um, more than the US today or other developed countries today. And the reason is that broad-based internal taxes like a consumption tax require state capacity. So you need resources like you know, tax collectors, you know, people to go around and tax the collect um, and actually collect taxes. But you also need rules that can be enforced and you need a uh, perceived legitimacy of the state. So people need to actually be willing to follow the rules and pay the IRS and not avoid taxes and all that. Tariffs, however, are a little bit different. They can be easier to implement for a few reasons. Um, a big one is that they can be collected at the border. Governments typically already have a presence at the border. You know, there's some national defense or customs or immigration control. And so adding tax collection to that doesn't require as many physical or human resources. Trade flows are also pretty predictable. Um, you know, to have a, a, an internal consumption tax, you need to know who's consuming what, and that can be, that can be a big task. Trade flows, um, you know, they, they come in at a certain place, and it's easy to see what's there and put a value on it um, and collect the taxes there. And lastly, the, the entities you're actually taxing um, are either going to be, you know, most likely multinational corporations, um, you know, the foreign exporters that are bringing goods in, or the domestic-based importers, which are likely to be larger companies. So these are entities that are gonna be more capable of paying on average, uh, and also more likely to follow the rules because they have an interest in staying in good graces with the government, right? You know, for exporters, tariffs are the price of doing business. And for importers, um, you know, they're large companies that might not wanna get on the wrong side of the government for other reasons. And so for developing countries or countries that otherwise have low state capacity, tariffs could be justified on public finance grounds. They could be the least costly tax that's actually available to them. So lastly, a lot of this, uh, a lot of what we've been talking about and a lot of the policy debate around trade is about limiting imports. But export restrictions are not actually unheard of. They do exist. So there are a few common justifications of them. Um, one would be for critical economic sectors, so sectors that a country thinks are so important to the economy that the resources they produce are actually banned from leaving the country. So an example of this was that in the United States, uh, exports of crude oil were banned until 2013. And this was actually very consequential. The United States, um, since a couple years after that, has been a net exporter of crude oil. So this is actually a pretty important sector for the United States in terms of exports, but um, you know, because it was considered critical, exports were banned. Uh, there are also some national defense justifications. So um, these are common, um, but recently the US has banned sales of a lot of tech or software uh, products to Chinese companies. Um, and in particular here, it's, it's not exactly a broad-based ban, um, though that's, you know, that is still the case for other policies, um, but there's a particular list of companies that are considered to be too close to the Chinese government, and it's more of a, um, you know, national security, um, you know, international affairs thing, and not really trade per se. There are also humanitarian reasons why exports could be restricted. Um, so in response to famines, countries will often ban exports of food. Um, and in response to um, shortages of, of medical supplies, um, uh, those can often be, uh, exports of those can often be restricted. Um, so for example, um, exports of vaccines are heavily, heavily restricted right now because um, you know, they're such a scarce and valuable resource. And lastly, um, you know, justification for protectionism or trade policy in general um, could be the effects of trade on inequality. But remember that the distribution of income and the effects of it um, from trade do include the effects of exports as well as imports. So next we're gonna take a look at a case study of um, 
how exports can affect inequality and how that can provide a motivation for protectionism. So in particular, we are looking at the case of quinoa. So um, quinoa, as I'm sure many of you know, is an ancient grain, comes from Central America. Um, and in Central American countries, it is actually a staple crop still. So it's a really common um, food source and um, it can account for a lot of the share of calories that people actually get. Um, so in the late 2000s, uh, there was this boom of quinoa. It suddenly became popular in many uh, Western countries. Um, and we saw rapid increases in import demand and the price of quinoa. So our trade analysis would say that this is going to be good for quinoa producers. Um, and, you know, presumably it's good for national welfare overall, right? It's sort of a terms of trade argument. Um, you know, the price of Central American countries' exports went up there, uh, and this is going to be good for them. However, you know, quinoa is a staple crop, and the increase in price could be harmful to those that rely on it. And so this could provide a motivation for restrictions on exports of quinoa. And so, you know, at some point into this boom, people started to grow concerned over the ethics of quinoa imports and whether this was leading to negative effects in um, communities that actually rely on quinoa. So were these concerns justified? Well, um, in theory, there's a few things that um, we need to know before we can answer this question of, you know, how did the increase in price of quinoa affect quinoa growing communities? So one, um, according to the Stolper-Samuelson theorem, an increase in the price of a good is going to benefit factors that the export is intensive in. So we, need, we do need to know if it's labor or land or capital or something else intensive. Um, I don't know exactly, but um, you know, we can assume that it's an agricultural commodity. So land is going to be especially important and um, it's most likely more labor intensive than some other sectors. <clears throat> So um, Stolper-Samuelson theorem says that land or labor, um, you know, but in general, things that are gonna be used in the quinoa sector are going to be better off. However, an increase in the price of a good is also harmful to the consumers of the good. And so the net gain from trade, it's going to depend on their factor endowments, right? Do they own the factor that quinoa is intensive in? Uh, or just, you know, more simply, are they quinoa producers? But it also depends on what they consume. Are they quinoa consumers? Is net production or net consumption higher? That's going to determine the welfare effects of the price increase. And so to understand how the quinoa boom affected inequality or affected you know, standards of living of the median person in a quinoa growing community, we need to know a couple things. We need to know if a majority of people are net buyers or net sellers of quinoa. We also need to know if it's labor or land intensive. And if it's land intensive, do quinoa producers own the land that they produce on? In that case, you know, even if you work in the quinoa sector, it might be that you don't yourself capture the gains from that, it would go to whoever owns the land. So to resolve this, um, <clears throat> you know, this question of did quinoa exports harm the poor in quinoa producing communities? Um, a few years ago, agricultural economist Mark Bellamare um, and some co-authors um, um, did a study and wrote a paper of it. So they found, you know, to be expected that the quinoa boom led to large increases in income for quinoa producers. Um, so that's in line with trade theory. But surprisingly, it also led to large increases in overall consumption for non-producers in quinoa growing communities. So this graph over here, the um, orange line is the, uh, it's, it's the real consumption of um, quinoa growers in, um, I believe they were looking at a Peruvian community. Um, and real consumption, it's basically going to be a measure of income or of standard of living. And so, um, you know, starting from when the price of quinoa was increasing in the 2000s, you can see that the real consumption of quinoa producers is increasing pretty rapidly. You know, you have this very large increase in standards of living. Um, the blue line are people in this in these communities who are um, not quinoa producers, but also not quinoa consumers. So, you know, ex ante, we're not really sure how they're going to be affected. Um, 
but you might assume nothing, right? The price is increased. The price increase isn't going to hurt them because they don't consume quinoa, but it's not going to help them because they also don't produce it. But in fact, their standards of living increased quite a bit too. And for quinoa consumers, and, and this gray line, these are people who consume quinoa but do not produce it. These are people we would expect to be harmed by the price increase. But in fact, we see a pretty similar overall increase to the non-consumers. Um, it's less than the producers, but in the same ballpark. And so this is a little bit surprising, um, but there are a couple reasons why this might be the case. Um, you know, one is uh, that uh, quinoa consumers have the ability to um, substitute away from quinoa and to consume other products, um, other staple crops. So, you know, rice or wheat or, you know, beans or something else. Um, and so that could be the case, could be why their standards of living didn't decline. But we do see that non-consumers and consumers had similar increases overall, so substitution can't be the whole story. But what this does suggest is that the export boom in quinoa must have had some spillover effects. So the increase in income of the producers must have led to some other broad-based gains in the community. Um, so increased demand in other sectors, possibly. And so, um, if the first few slides on this made you worried about your quinoa consumption and whether or not it was the right thing to do, um, you know, this paper says that actually quinoa um, tends to be better, uh, quinoa exports and consumptions um, have been pretty good for um, people in quinoa growing communities. Um, and in fact, that these gains are distributed pretty broadly and it's not just the producers or landowners or something that are capturing them. Okay, so to conclude, um, protectionist policies are really not the dominant thing these days, um, although there has been some resurgence and there is clearly some latent demand um, as evidenced by the institutions that constrain protectionism. So our economic analysis of trade and trade policies can help us decide whether free trade or protectionist policies are justified. We looked at several justifications for protectionism, including the optimal tariff argument, which there's some evidence for, um, domestic market failures, um, as well as the tax revenue argument um, and how for developing countries or countries with low state capacity, tariffs could be the best of um, uh, otherwise bad choices for uh, efficient taxation. Um, and we considered the effects of trade on inequality, um, in particular through export restrictions and the case of quinoa. Um, 